Okay, let's get right into it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series on climate change AI. And today's topic is machine learning in agriculture and forestry under a climate change perspective. So my name is David Dow, and I'm the community lead for agriculture and forestry. So this topic is very, very close to my heart. Um, and I'm also a PhD student currently in computer science at ETH Zurich. So for those who um, attend the very first event of climate change, one quick note about us. So Climate Change AI is um, an initiative that um, aims to um, catalyze and foster impactful work at the intersection of climate change and machine learning by providing education and infrastructure as well as community building and um, um, free resources to advance discourse in this space. So we're really a network of researchers and policymakers and we provide resources for you to join in the discussion. Um, we organize a lot of events. So if you're interested in the topic of climate change and ML, then we encourage you to check out our workshops. Sorry, Levitt. I'm right now in Costa Rica and a couple cars passing by. So it's going to be a little bit more louder. So, but anyway, so we are organizing several events and conferences. Um, this one right now you're attending. Um, and, but we are also encouraging you to look into our workshops, which we hold in machine learning conferences, where we always publish and um, showcase all the videos and results and they are all publicly available um, for you to read and look into. There's a very cool webinar coming up soon on coastal adaptation and sea level rise on May 21st, where Dr. Francis Moore is speaking on um, how we can use social media data to improve measurements and monitoring for class, uh, coastal flooding, as well as Dr. Scott Kalb from Climate Central talking about using deep learning to assess coastal vulnerability. So if you like this webinar, you should also join the next webinar. Um, and you should join the Climate Change AI Network. You can find all information here via on social media as well as um, climatechange.ai. So without further ado, let's get right into today's topic. Um, it's a very timely topic. And we're talking today about agriculture and forestry because together these two sectors contribute as much as 25% to the global emissions. Um, and in order to really achieve the targets set by the Paris Agreement, there's no way around um, figuring out how to better manage our lands. Um, can ML and AI help for us to um, better contribute and manage agriculture and forest conservation more efficiently? This is the topic we are discussing today. And in this spirit, we are so honored to have Dr. Emily Lines joining us today. Emily is a lecturer in physical geography at the University of Cambridge and a future leaders fellow and a Turing fellow at the Turing Institute. Okay, I think I will have to do it without the slide. Um, our next speaker has been investigating the use of artificial intelligence in the agricultural sector for quite a while. And we are honored to have uh, Jigar Doshi to talk about um, his work at Vatani AI. Jigar is a research lead at Vatani AI and is interested in applying AI for social impact, particular in the area of agriculture and public health. Jigar leads the team responsible for data labeling, model training, and deployment in production. Before Vatani AI, he was the head of machine learning at CrowdAI, a Silicon Valley startup working on geospatial applications. And at CrowdAI, he led projects that use satellite imagery for disaster mapping, forest fire tracking, as well as release of XPD data set. And before CrowdAI, he worked at IBM Research and Georgia Tech. Thank you so much for joining us today, and the stage is yours. Okay, you can hear me now. Yes. I can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Okay, thank you everybody. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I also have questions for Emily. So it's good. Uh, so my name is Jigger. I'm a research lead uh, at, at Wife of Cotton Farming. I'm going to spend maybe five minutes or so at the start. Um, uh, 
Unmute. Okay, I think I'm back. Am I back? Okay. You can try to turn off your camera. Maybe that helps with the connection. People hear me? Yes. Yeah, let me do that. Yep. Okay. Let me try this again. Okay. It's working fine. Now. Yes. Okay, so let me, so um, my name is Jiffer. I'm gonna talk about AI for cotton farming at Vadwani Institute. Um, and I'll spend a little bit at the start describing sort of the Institute and how we formulate problems and how we work on them. And then hopefully this becomes one instantiation of, of that um, like others. So. Well, the only Institute of AI, we are really young. We are three years old now. Um, we, we are an independent profit uh, focused on developing AI solutions for the underserved or global south, as they call it sometimes. Um, we are about 100 people now. It's an eclectic mix of uh, ML scientists and ag researchers and uh, farmers and public health experts and doctors and all sorts of people, um, both technical and on the ground kinds of folks. Um, so the way we think about these um, solutions that we work on um, is sort of inside out and outside in. Outside in is systems and programs um, and the stakeholders that eventually will um, deploy these solutions um, to impact. Um, while also considering the core innovation, core technology, whatever you want to call it, the AI at the center of it. So we start with both the outside and the inside and this sort of collaborative joint approach um, is a unique thing that at least got attracted, attracted me to join, join them. Um, so it, it, AI, model, if you want to think about AI just as a model, as an inference model, um, sits inside a product, say an app, which sort of sits inside a solution, which may be um, a cute software, which then must integrate with existing systems or new systems, whatever that may be, such that there is, there is pathway to impact, okay? So this is sort of the thinking around this. Um, I'm going to talk about, so these are the sort of projects that we work on at uh, Vadwani. I'm going to talk about the pest management solution at uh, cotton farming today, but let me say a little bit about the other ones. Um, all the remaining are in healthcare. Um, the first one actually, is, I would say one of the coolest ones that we have is uh, 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 trying to measure baby uh, anthropometry of newborn babies and tracking their weight and growth, especially in the first uh, six to eight months. Um, and so this is done through phones now, 3D models, all sorts of cool things. Um, actually, most of last year, uh, the Institute chose to focus on COVID stuff. So we were working on um, epidemiological modeling, um, helping the city and uh, the states, that kind of stuff for resource planning. Um, and that was, it, we closed, all, all those efforts uh, earlier this year. Um, I, I, most of my time actually last year was spent in uh, doing um, billing um, COVID screening for coughs from cough sounds. So voice or cough uh, can be used as a screen um, device for COVID. And then we have a couple of interesting projects on uh, TB. The only thing I want to say is all of these are sort of directly in alignment, directly in collaboration and co-creation almost with the partners. And in this case, some of these partners are governments. Um, we actually uh, uh, think about 
this seven question framework um, on how to pick a problem and how to continue to believe on working on a problem. So is the problem big enough? Does it have AI solutions? Does the AI component itself make a difference or is it good to have? Um, is it acceptable to the stakeholders? So even before we build anything, even before we collect a model, we'll have a mock and show, the, show to the partners, right? So, so doing this sort of joint co-creation, of course, the, does the data exist? It's an obvious question. This crowd doesn't need that um, thought. And hopefully, so this, I, I'm gonna try and frame the rest of the talk somewhat around this um, on trying to come up with a big enough problem. Does it have an AI solution? Does it make a difference? And will the stakeholders accept it? And is there a path to scale, right? Is there a path to reach all of that? So that's the plan now. Um, so let's get into this. Uh, AI for cotton farming. Uh, as a background, for cotton farming is a cash crop, I guess. It has been a cash crop for, for centuries now. Um, India continues to be a, a big um, producer and also reliant on cotton as an export. Um, six million farmers in India work on cotton. Um, most of them are smallholders. The definition of smallholders is just anybody who owns land that's less than two hectares. Um, and there's 75% of these. So that's our target, um, target, target, uh, I don't know what to call it, target uh, customer base, demography that we would like to help. Um, when we were starting the institute, roughly two, three years ago, um, actually three, no, 2018, um, th it, there was lots of news about um, cotton farmers' suicides in India, mostly because uh, um, they are indebted because of this uh, variability in their yield. They are too much in debt, and they then they reach to the point that they I don't know, take their lives. Um, so what is the problem? The problem is sort of uncertainty in yield and income, um, especially around, so this is a sort of overall topic of uncertainty in yield and income. One of the causes of that um, is pests. Pest damages cost uh, caused due, due to pests. As a funny side note, um, this big pollworm is actually eradicated in US. US is also a big cotton producer uh, for whatever reason, I, I mean, we'll get into it, but it happened. The best in resistant to the BT cotton, to the hybrid cotton that, that is supposedly resistant to these um, um, pests. So this is a big problem. Um, oh no. Okay. Um, what are the numbers? Um, about 20, it's estimated, and uh, 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 20 to 30 percent um, in India, especially the uh, the loss uh, in yield is due to pests. These are avoidable. Um, how are they avoidable? So one of the, th I mean, two ways, right? So pesticides, um, you can put the right amount of pesticide so that. Um, You kill the kill the pest, but sometimes when you when you overdo it, um, then you are also in decreasing the yield. And uh, if you underdo it, then the pests eat your plants, right? So it's a simple simple sort of fine line of right amount of pesticide needed. Um, Fifty five percent of the pesticides used in India go to go into cotton farms, and so try, uh, one of the goals, uh, one of the primary goals of this is to both increase the yield by decreasing the pesticide use for the farmers, right? That's the sort of core motivation where we come from. Um, so what tends to happen currently is because there isn't the right kind of advisory available, um, it's ad hoc. So most of the time they get the advisory that is generic. Um, and so it's expensive for the farmers because they overspray. Um, it's harmful for them because these are bad pesticides, uh, obviously bad for environment and also bad for the farmer themselves because the long-term yield of the soil goes down, right? Damage to the soil. Um, 
So what I want to do next is maybe walk you guys through um, the existing sort of workflow. So this is a known problem, right? Over, over pesticide, this is not a new problem. So what is the existing workflow? So now, now we are getting into the solutioning aspect of it, given that we have been sort of understanding and have motivated the problem. Uh, so the existing workflow is they would have these traps installed in the farms, um, pheromone traps, and I'll show you some examples of this. Um, and then extension workers or field workers through these programs visit the farms, do manual checking, upload the app to a central repository that gets digitized from various different sources. Sometimes it's manual. And then almost always the advisory generation is a manual process where somebody does some analysis at Cotton Institute's government setup. And then the advisory gets decimated. Um, the problem with this is this takes one to two weeks and cotton is a very sensitive crop. Uh, and if you miss the window, these boll worms go from the leaves into the bowl of the cotton and then it's too late um, to save it. So in some ways, this is the kind of inefficiency that we uh, saw and saw an opportunity um, to do some impact. So let me show you what it looks like. Uh, let me load this as I walk you through. So on the left um, is a real demo of a farmer uh, on in, uh, removing um, these pheromone traps. As the camera pans up, you'll see how the pheromone traps look. Um, and he's supposed to remove them and add a white sheet of paper. Now, this is a work protocol that we came up with, but this is something that we've jointly worked with them. Whether it's possible, whether it's not possible, is something like this doable for them? Will they have a white sheet? Will they not have a white sheet? These kind of questions, obviously, for us living in the labs and in the cities, we don't know. So this is uh, co-developed with them. Um, actually, this is existing workflows because they have these uh, pheromone traps installed. Um, subsequently, what they're supposed to do is take pictures um, of these traps on the white background. So it looks something like this. And then uh, we have a model, in offline model, object detection model that uh, identifies these pests and counts them. Uh, once we have the right kinds of pests, so pink ball one for this talk uh, identified, then we give them the right advisory. So on the right, you can see, uh, because they have five pink ball worms, they have high alert, uh, high infestation alert, and they should, they should do something about it. Um, and so this, this is how, um, we plug into the existing workflow. So if you if you saw so, saw it before, where, where the extension worker on the left would go in and then collect these uh, manually, and the whole process takes longer. So this is this is the sort of from technology perspective. Um, what do they look like? So I, I want to get a little bit into sort of the data and the nitty gritty of the technical aspects. Uh, so it, it's in some ways simple, right? It's it's a object detection problem, um, and we want counts, and that's all we care about, right? The location of it doesn't matter, um, but it's not so simple in the field, right? So these are good examples, um, but it gets funny because it's not clear what this is, for example. Um, sometimes they don't um, use white background; they use some other kinds of background, and then th these. This is what we call as phantom. Uh, or ghost, ghost pests. Um, on the left is is just impossible to do anything about, but this is the kinds of things that we see. Um, on the right, so now that there is a scale aspect to it as well, right? Uh, in addition to density and overlap. So density, overlap, scale. Uh, one of the problems that uh, actually, I don't have a picture of that. I should have, oh. You can see some of it. So one of the problems that typically the model fails at is these pests, pests um, are broken. Or they're, they're, what is the right word? They're, their legs are broken, their heads are broken. So technically it's still the foreground and technically it looks like, uh, you know, what uh, the pest should be, but it's wrong count. 
So these kind of problems become tricky. And for us, um, the count has to be, we are very sensitive to miscounts because then we give the wrong alert. So we can't afford to miscount by more than two or three. Um, so anyway, what's the model? I mean, I don't, I can go into more of the detail, but given the time, I'll keep it, keep it short. It's simple object detection model. Um, nothing out of the, out of the blue. Um, the, the basic idea, the constraints under which we are working is it has to be an offline model because at, in the farms, there is no internet connection and it has to work on all the low cost um, devices. So the model and the whole app doesn't have to be more than X MB, which means the model has to be, so our budget is five MB. The model cannot be more than five MB. Um, so, which means, which, you know, obviously then big transformer models are out of the question, or at least for now. Um, so we have two heads, uh, the usual detection head at the top that gives a count out. Um, and then if, if it's um, at the right threshold, we give the right recommendation. One of the things that we found that really helps improve our overall system accuracy is having a second head, which does basic classification of whether it's a legitimate image, whether it's decluttered image. For example, the cluttered pest image that I showed before, actually I can show you here, this one on the left now is classified as something we don't even try and predict. Like this is something wrong and we actually give the feedback back to the users um, to, to retake. Um, and now there are interesting active learning model, active learning sort of ideas um, that we can try. Um, and please feel free to ask me questions about this. I'm gonna move on um, to the results. So where are we? Uh, we have been doing this for two years. So four seasons, um, summer, so typically cotton happens in um, summer and fall. Fall is the big season. Fall is where maybe, I don't know, majority of the cotton farming happens. Um, we have close to 300,000 images, um, more than 200,000 um, annotated, so 200,000 pests images across uh, all states, all relevant states in India where cotton happens. Um, this is the app now, it's real, we made it. Uh, it's in eight different languages, we onboard the farmers in the app. Um, so reducing all the manual steps, right? So it's not just about the, about the model, but making sure that overall it works. Um, so offline inference, um, they get these demos and you know, looks like this. Um, and actually this is something that I thought was uh, interesting to share here was uh, as we were working at this, uh, it, it, this dashboard is what is used by a lot of our partners, uh, ex ex extension workers and programs. So programs is how, who we need to convince so that we can go and help uh, the farmers because they are the boots on the ground. And in order for us to convince them, we end up building these kind of stuff. Actually, we use this more than them now. Um, so where we are now is we have done two field experiments. We got an external um, impact evaluation done um, on summer. Actually, it, it became a small scale uh, study instead of a big one because of COVID. Um, and so this is real, this works. Uh, we, this improves due to various improvements, not just the AI model, the impact that we um, want or trying to achieve. So increasing the yield by actually decreasing pesticide use. So that's sort of where we are um, and actually end quickly. Um, thank you everybody. And by the way, I, I should thank um, uh, Google.org, this is funded by them. They actually fund, they, they funded this when the, this was the first funding we got as an institute. So it, thank you to them and thank you to lots of collaborators. Some of these slides are from my collaborators. So it's just, not just me. Thank you. <laughs>